Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be addressing the juvenile courts. To begin this chapter, we're going to be looking at the history of the evolution of the mega bureaucracy that the criminal justice system is, and specifically the juvenile courts. We're going to look at how the law has evolved over time. We're going to be looking at the proceedings beginning with um, when they, you know, first are arrested and have to go to court. Then we're going to look at the actual proceedings and then sentencing. And then we'll also address recidivism and some of the principles of juvenile court excellence to wrap up the chapter. Um, but again, the overall history of the juvenile courts, as we've talked about in this class, you know, this is something that has evolved over time. Our attitudes toward whether or not juveniles or younger people should be treated like children and separate from adults has been an ongoing process. Your book in this chapter talks a lot about transfer, having to go from juvenile courts to adult courts. Again, that does happen um, for specific crimes. Some states for murder, uh, burglary, things along those lines, armed violence, aggravated assault often can be tried as an adult, um, just depending upon the state you're in and then their general, the judge and their policies, their codes, their laws, et cetera. Um, but again, the bureaucracy itself has evolved over time. It's also important to note that each state kind of has its own approach. Some states, you know, only have exclusively judges hearing courts. Other states might have magistrates. Other states might have referees. So again, depending upon your, where you are, the system itself is can be a little bit different. So don't assume that it's standardized. But again, there are some federal and state laws that guide the entire process. And then, you know, it is us who created the system in the first place. We decided that there was a social problem. There was a need to create this institution that we call the juvenile justice system to work with some specific aspect of the population. And so we are the ones who have constructed this. And then we have different philosophies from which should guide our judgment. The book talks about parents patrie philosophy or the state as a parent. You know, does the state have the right to intervene in cases? How much rights does the state have over the parent? Uh, also looking at a justice model, should the juvenile justice system be created to, you know, exert justice, <laughs> I guess is the easiest way to say it. But again, if a crime is committed, who's responsible for dealing with that crime and sentencing and things along those lines? Um, but again, our attitudes this, toward this have changed over time. In recent times, you've seen decriminalization of status offenses, uh, determinate sentencing, and so that's not so arbitrary with the judge, mandatory sentencing, um, so that it's you know standardized across the board, um, opening up of juvenile proceedings and records, um, you know, things along these lines. On the right here from your book, we have the, IG, the ideals of the juvenile court. This is what the court is supposed to be based on. Um, you should be given the same care as that provided by a good parent. Again, paid parents, patrie. The aim of the court is to restore, help, and forgive. Again, the justice model. You should not be treated as criminals. Again, this different attitude incorporating psychological knowledge of development, um, you know, troubled homes, socioeconomic status factors, all of these things, and the rights of use, um, the idea of that youth do have rights, even though they're not adults, has evolved over time. We'll talk about that. Um, they have the right to shelter, protection, and proper guardianship. Um, some changes in the legal norm. This uh, this chart is from your book. It just goes a little bit more deep into everything, but I pulled out just a few of them so we can kind of look at how the justice system has changed over time with our attitude. Um, so Kent v. United States 1966 gets into jurisdiction and it creates this, you know, does the juvenile court system have jurisdiction compared to the adult system? When should a juvenile be sent to the adult system? Things along this lines were worked out there. Uh, Henry Galt, uh, this is constitutional procedure into juvenile courts. Do the you know, juveniles have the right to a jury trial, things along those lines. Um, in rewinship, juveniles are entitled to proof beyond a reasonable doubt during adjudication proceedings. So again, we have to prove their guilt. We can't just be like their kids and do whatever we want with them. Uh, McIver v. Pennsylvania, right to a jury trial. Again, not adopted by all states. 
Breed versus Jones, juvenile court cannot adjud adjudicate a case and then transfer the case over to an adult court. So again, this gets into that jurisdiction that works off of Kent. At what point does the juvenile court have just jur jurisdiction? And what point does that get transferred to the adult court? And this again is can be a case by case basis, but there are statuses and policies and procedures in place for this. So sorry. Um, so juvenile courts today, Special and separate juvenile courts in some urban areas devote their total effort to the legal problems of children. What you're going to find is, again, as I was saying before, depending upon the region, the jurisdiction, the state, everybody has their own type of systems. And then if you're looking at it by region, like city versus or urban versus suburban versus rural, they might also have different types of systems. So when you have large urban systems that have a huge population to cope with, they've built a much more finite assembly line approach, I guess is the best way to put it, to get people into court. And then depending upon your where it changes, juveniles in smaller cities and rural areas are often tried by judges of adult courts, whereas in the city you don't have as many judges, so they often pass these on to magistrates or referees. A uh, separate statewide court exists in several states. Um, <clears throat> for juveniles, and only juvenile judges sit on cases in the various districts in these states. So again, we have judges that are elected to do just juveniles, judges that are elected to just do um, adults. Other parts of the country, juvenile offenders are handled exclusively by family court judges who hear both juvenile and domestic relations cases. And so that's another blending of family court and juvenile court. And then more typically, juvenile courts are part of a circuit, district, county, superior, common pleas, probate, or municipal court. And on the left, I have all the judges. Again, the juvenile judge, they're the ones who make sure that the law is enforced and do the sentencing and uh, the structuring of the trial, the structuring of the dating and when the court should happen, etc. Uh, the referee doesn't have the same level of a judge, but they often have the same authority where they can be primary hearing officers, um, but sometimes that can be referred to a judge. You have defense attorneys that advocate for the defense. You have the prosecutor that advocates for the state. You have the probation officer that if somebody is sentenced, you know, then to probation, that person manages them, you know, throughout their sentencing time. And if anything happens, they, you know, have the option to send them back to jail. And then you have uh, uh, non-judicial support personnel. And again, this is the entire staff, the administration, all the people working in the back offices, court stenographers, whatever it might be. Okay. So again, it's a very complex bureaucracy that has been built and structured to deal with the social problem, which is juvenile delinquency. It is not universal in every state. It does vary. But again, there are some basics to it, which the next um, kind of slide gets into, which is these procedural trials. Procedural, you're going to find that there are similar procedures, even if they have different people in places. So pre-trial procedures, what happens you know, beforehand. So the, the, um, the types of cases that are under the jurisdiction of juvenile court often vary, uh, but they generally include those involving juvenile delinquency, neglect, and dependency. Um, there were 818,000 cases handled in 2017. Since 1960s, the caseloads have doubled, um, but Crime has actually gone down. What the bureaucracy has grown, though. Okay, juvenile courts may also deal with cases involving adoption, termination of parent parental rights, appointment of guardians for minors, custody, contributing to delinquency or neglect and non-support, and then pretrial procedures in the juvenile justice system include the detention hearing, the intake procedure, and the transfer procedure, all of which take place before the adjudication stage of juvenile court proceedings. So essentially, someone gets arrested, right? Then they have to go before a judge or a magistrate or a referee to decide whether this case is going to go forward. Then they have to, you know, do their plea, guilty, not guilty. And then they set, a, you know, a court date. And then between this time, you know, people can work out plea deals. They can, you know, whatever it might be. You go through all your discovery motions. You know, you get your evidence. You present your evidence you know, to the other side before you guys go to court. All of this happens in pretrial. So again, your detention hearing is to decide whether or not you often get out on bail. 
um, your intake process, like if this is the court taking your name, getting all the information about you, you might be in the jail when this is happening, or you might have just been given a citation in order to come to court and provide yourself and this information. And then the transfer procedure is the prosecutors deciding whether this should be held in juvenile court or kicked up to adult court. And then for the actual trial itself, you have the, um, or again, the initial adjudication hearing. Um, and so up top, I have the chart here. This is the fact finding stage of the court's proceedings. Again, like I'm saying, going through discovery, figuring out what evidence they're going to have, deciding which witnesses they're going to have, you know, su supply all that information to the court. They decide the dates, the proceedings, how long it should take. The disposition hearing is the traditional purpose is to administer individualized justice and to set in motion the rehab of delinquent. Again, this is when we figure out whether someone is guilty or innocent, and then we go through the process of sentencing. Um, and then so again, during this trial procedure is when we're either going to make a plea deal or whether the court's going to go through and have a trial to decide whether or not somebody is guilty or innocent. Um, but again, you can see since 1960s, the data had gone up, but then in the 90s, everything starts to drop off. So this total delinquency has gone down. And so again, same with the adjudication of cases. So even this last slide, it says that it's gone up since the 60s. It's a little bit incorrect in that um, right here in this last slide, sorry, since 1960s, the case slows have doubled. But again, that's population. Crime in general has actually gone down. Um, and so again, at the disposition hearing, once a youth has been found delinquent at the adjudicatory, adjudicatory stage, <laughs> some juvenile court codes still permit judges to proceed immediately to the disposition in the sentencing hearing, but this can often be postponed as they hear, you know, contributing factors, whether like the grades, how they're doing in school, maybe some police officers having some thoughts on this. Uh, and the final stage of the proceeding, juveniles are permitted to have legal counsel. And the Kent decision ensures the right of counsel to challenge the facts of the social study. And again, we also have the right to appeal for juveniles in most states. There are these judicial alternatives to sending somebody to jail. These include dismissal, restitution, like paying back what you did, outpatient psychiatric therapy, just being sentenced to probation with no jail time, uh, foster home, if it comes to that. There are a lot of situations, day treatment programs, which can be anywhere from skill training to rehab programs, whatever it might be, community-based residential programs, institutionalization and mental hospital if that's deemed necessary. Uh, same with the county or a city institutionalization, state or private training school, and also adult facility or youthful offender facility are also other options. So again, the juvenile sentencing structure, your book gets into these two ideas of determinate sentencing, fixed sentencing, like mandatory sentencing, and indeterminate sentencing, which is based upon a judge's discretion within some legally supported time frame. Um, and so what this book states, though, is that generally you're going to see these blends of, you know, sometimes, you know, depending upon the individual and depending upon what the judge is required to do. Um, then they get to decide how they're going to treat them. They can also make the decision whether or not somebody's going to be transferred up to a higher court to make these decisions. Okay. And then delinquency across the life course, the impact of transfer on juveniles. Again, the book gets deep into the effects of what happens when you send kids to adult jails. And again, it increases the risk for all kinds of factors. Okay. So I had, there's a bunch of questions like who should be transferred? You know, what kids should be sent to adult institutions and put into an environment that can be detrimental? What, what are the consequences in terms of criminal sanctions as compared to juvenile court sanctions? Should they, you know, is an adult jail reasonable for the crimes that they committed as a kid? What effect does the prison system have on juveniles? And so there are juvenile jails and juvenile prisons to deal with this also, especially for people that are in long-term cares. And again, some of the institutional stories of kids who go here, it's a very tough environments. Just imagine what might happen, like a, you know, a soap in a sock. I mean, again, I've heard stories. What are the consequences of transfers to the individuals involved? How does it affect them in the moment when they're institution, but also how does it affect them across the lifespan? Juveniles tried as adults have higher recidivism rates. It increases the likelihood they're going to back to jail. But why? Because they're getting put into that environment where they might not be getting the skills, the support, 
the psychiatric help, plus they're being exposed to potentially violent criminals and that criminal way of life and that culture, which can be very rough. Um, it's also associated with stigma. What happens when they get that felony and it's on their record and they can't come off because it's not a juvenile record, it's an adult record, which means it's on their life forever, unless they can find a way to get it expunged. The sense of resentment and injustice they feel about being tried as an adult as a kid. Um, they learn the criminal cultural way of life and criminal behaviors in prison and develop an entire network. Can increase things like drug dealing and exposure to that. Um, it, it also, the adult, you know, is definitely less focused on rehabilitation and more just about managing people. Whereas the juvenile justice system, they'll have schools and things like that to help out. Also a family support system. Juveniles are also more likely to be victimized, including sexual assault in the adult system than they are in the juvenile system. So again, it can be detrimental. But again, what can we as a society with our bureaucracy do to not only manage the situation, but manage the situation most effectively? And again, there are a bunch of approaches to criminal justice and how we should decide how we treat people, how we take them in, how we sentence them, the places that we send them, the types of jails, what the jails are like, the culture of the jails, you know what I mean? It's the entire system itself from the staff, facilities, you know, whatever it might be. The judges, do they have bias? Do they have the kids' best interest or do they just have justice as their best interest? What is their guiding principle? And so again, we're always thinking about how to make the bureaucracy better. But again, this bureaucracy exists to deal with the social problem or what we've deal, you know, decided is a social problem, which is juvenile delinquency. And how do we best manage juvenile delinquency? Is, you know, do we just leave it up to the parents? Or does the state need to step in just to make sure that society remains stable and that we have a nice, predictable, stable society? What's it like when you have a bunch of, you know, kids running around like hoodlums just rolling people in the street? You know what I mean? Like in the old movies where they'd roll the drunks, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like gangs of New York style. But again, so do we need this system again that's arbitrary? And if we do need this system, what type of system did we develop? And if we look at our system, is it effective in managing the problem? And is it effective in rehabilitating people in a social justice sense to bring them back into the fold of society? Are we helping them get through school, get jobs, make their lives better, not make the same mistakes twice? Or are we just exposing them to an even worse environment by incarcerating them often? that can even make things even worse. So this is a couple of things to think about, okay? Really appreciate it. Y'all have a wonderful day.